Welcome everyone to this month's um, First Friday's online acoustic seminar. Um, this month, we're glad to have Sebastian Gonzalez. He's a, a researcher at the Milan Polytechnic Institute, and he's working at the uh, Violin Museum in Cremona doing research on violins. And um, so um, I'm going to have him tell us a bit more about himself, his background, and his research. So. Welcome, Sebastian. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot, Paul, for the invitation, first of all. It's really a pleasure to be here. I mean, I would love that we could do it in person in the US, but I mean, maybe next year. Um, OK, so um, since Paul asked me to do a little bit of an introduction, uh, this will be a talk on what I understand as and data-driven approach to instrument making, and I will try to make it to make the case for it. Like, and what do I mean by data-driven? But first, uh, I want to like introduce myself and my, like my tradition of making and how I arrived to this. And and this is uh, Wolfgang Ubel. Uh, he was a 13th generation violin maker from Germany, from Magna Kirchen. And I met him in Celle. I well, actually I married his granddaughter. So they kind of adopted me in the family. And the day I arrived to Celle, I sat in that little chair that's there and I started to see how Opa was working, like carving a scroll and, and fixing some violins. And I just completely fell in love with violin making or instrument making in general, not, not just violins. And I divorced from, from Julia, my ex-wife, but I continue to keep contact with the Uber family. And Opa passed away last year in November, but I keep on working with her daughter, with his daughter. And yeah, I, I was doing my PhD in physics back then. Uh, I was very tired of doing just uh, simulations and stuff with my hands, but in the computer. So I wanted like a change. And when I met this family, I, I just said, like, okay, this it is. I, I have to start learning it. And, and this is my own workshop. It's in my house. And I just got all the tools and I started learning. Uh, I started my first violin. I closed it last year. I still don't paint it. Um, and I've been trying to apply what I know from physics into violin making. Uh, and that will be today's talk. And I will put my watch this is where I can see it. Um, I want to talk about what we have done with violins and artificial intelligence that you may or may not have seen that paper that it came, I think, a year ago, now in May. Uh, and what are the recent advances of it? Also, a little bit of a quantification of the FRF or the, the frequency response function or bridge admittance. Uh, in the picture there, you can see a plate. And then finally, um, metamaterials applied to guitars. Uh, but I think it could be used also in violins. But I think that's a weird proposition, but I like it. Anyway, I, I hope you enjoy. If you have questions, just go ahead, just talk and interrupt me. Uh, I don't think I can see a chat, so it's better if you just speak. Uh, um, if you want, you can okay. also use the chat. I'll, I'll monitor the chat for you, Sebastian. Okay, great. Um, so violins, the, the first part. Uh, this is a parametrization of a violin outline that I found in a drawing by Ceruti. It's uh, part of the museum collection, and it just shows how the outline of the, bio, of the violin can be translated into points in the real in the real 2D space or in a plane and um, radiuses. So it's a way for me of translating a shape into numbers. And I think that's the whole idea of a data-driven approach. How can we turn violins or whatever instrument into numbers? Because computers understand numbers, and that's what they're good at, not at um, 3D shapes and, and structures. They work with numbers. 
Um, so the, the first thing, like, to train a neural network, and if somebody doesn't know what a neural network is, I will do a little explanation. But it's, you can just think it as this black box that you give them some numbers and it gives you an answer. In the case of the violence, what we wanted to do is to give a description of a violin shaped object, because we don't do it with the actual violin yet, but a model of it, and try the, net, the neural network to tell us the way in which the violin vibrates. And for that, since the violins are like three-dimensional objects, like the picture doesn't work. And um, in the computational world, we are used to work with just images, 2D images. You have a cat and a dog, and a neural network will predict which one is a cat, which one is a dog. But in the case of a violin, since they are like these 3D objects, um, you cannot simply use images. Um, so how do we construct this data set? Uh, as I said before, we have a set of parameters that define the outline, which is those 16 points with the radii and the, the angles. And you can like, nicely define an, an outline. This one is, I think, a good approximation to the outline of the Messiah. Um, when you have the points, if you make all the circles, you obtain a violin shaped object. Um, we have also the thickness profile uh, that's important in a violin and the way we parameterize it's just one way not all of them was to create different regions of different thickness that's best, uh, on the violin plate and in the left you can see an historical example where you have this clearly two regions in the upper boat and in the lower boat that's a bit thinner, uh, red it's thin, yellow it's thick, and the central region is thicker, and it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And our version of the violins, it's artificial violins, so they have a variable random thickness in the nine regions that we define. We could do it in a different way, like more, I don't know, like some contour lines and change those contour lines. This is just one possible approximation to define a variable thickness object. Uh, in the worst case, you can give the height of each of the points with a given resolution, and you put that in the, in the neural network, but it's too time consuming. Um, we also change the arching profile of the violins. So we fit one arching to a Stradivarius violin and then by some simple mathematical um, coordinates transformation we can compress or enlarge the arching so we obtain um, violins that are more i don't know round baroque and more modern flat archings this is um, a high map of just the arching for two violins with the same outline <clears throat> and once you have that data set, you can make simulations of it. And yes, I know it's missing the F holes and the bus bar, but step by step. Uh, and actually, if somebody will ask me how I'm going to parameterize the F holes, that's a very good question because I have no idea. There are some methods to do like uh, the composition of complex shapes in, in eigenvectors, but I think that goes a bit beyond. Anyway, the, um, this is the whole data set of the plates that we created, sorted by the mean frequency in the first 10 modes. And in the plot in the right, I'm showing how it's the vibrational response of the plate in the left. And you can see that there is no much of a relation between the shape and the eigenfrequency, except that in average, the violin is becoming longer as the frequency response goes higher. And this is maybe a bit fast, but slow. But if I go fast, you can see 
Here, it's very thin, very ugly. I mean, this is not historical violin. Um, but the response, the average response is very high, whereas like a little in the other end, if it's round and chubby, it has a, a low frequency. But you also can see that different shapes has, have pretty much the same response. And that's an important point. But there is something in the chat. Uh, yeah, so just, Claudia asked, how did you get the eigenfrequencies? Yes. Perfect. Um, the, I simulated that mesh in console. Actually, I didn't do it. I will give the acknowledgments at the end. But it was David Salvi in his master thesis. And it's console with three boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions are quite important. And I will go back to them when I go to the guitar plates at the end of the presentation. Uh, does that answer your question, Claudia? Yes, so it's a, a finite uh, uh, element. Finite model. element model, okay. yeah. And so what mm. did you, so did you choose the same uh, orthotropic uh, properties for the wood? In that case, that was the uh, same wood for all the plates? You just change the shape or? Excellent question. No, well, I mean, yes and no. We did it for just the shape with the same material, but we also did it with different shapes and different materials. Okay. And I'm going to the, those results now. Uh, and if you see clearly, like, well, sorry, before that. Um, in some cases, there are like ripples. That was our first model. Our current model looks more, oh, sorry, I need to get out of this. Uh, our current model, it's like much nicer and smooth. And, and it doesn't have those ripples. It also has the, the purpling channel uh, inside the model. So we hope to put it in the CNC and obtain a, a violin shape easily. And I will go into that soon. So as, as Claudia asked, um, we have like the geometrical parameter is P the thickness profile, that in our case is nine, and the material parameters, which are nine. It's density, stiffnesses, uh, shear modulus, and Poisson ratios. And we vary all of them in a random way. Uh, so in principle, with this, we, can, we have a way of turning a set of numbers, like 40 numbers or so, into a violin. You just put it in the CNC and the CNC works. That if the CNC will be working, it's still not. I've been a month and a half dealing with the installation because I'm, I'm, I'm not an electric engineer. So this is completely out of my comfort zone. But anyway, the problem is like beyond the, the, the CNC working not or not, it's that measuring the material parameters for a piece of wood it's quite complicated. And I will go into more detail as I, I take the guitar as an example. But for example, for a, a guitar plate, which is just rectangular, you have Jim's uh, formula that correlates the fundamental modes to the stiffnesses. But those have a, an error associated to them. Like in our simulation, that error is around 3%. But that's high enough to like give you a complete different response, but I'm, I'm going back later. Okay, so we put these um, 30 or 40 parameters into a neural network and we predict the eigenfrequencies of it. And we obtain a very good agreement. Um, actually 90, like the R square measures the deviation from the straight line. And one year ago, that was very good. Now, if we improve the neural network and we can get even higher uh, results, but that would be in another paper. Um, okay, but the neural network, it's uh, useful because if we know, th this is called the forward problem, so from, from a set of parameters obtaining your response, because it will help us in the future to go from having a vibrational response to infer what are 
the parameters. And that's a minimization problem that's called inverse problem, which is in general much more difficult to solve than the forward problem. But if we have a neural network, we can do it faster, and that means that we have a chance to solve the inverse problem. Um, now, back at the statistical correlations between the thickness and the eigenfrequencies, um, if we vary only the thickness in these nine regions, we can see that they are correlated to each of the modes in a different way. So, for example, F1, the, the frequency of the first mode, it's mostly correlated with the thickness in the central part, um, whereas uh, F3, it's more correlated to the thickness in the F holes. And F2, it's very central because of its shape. Uh, but another thing is that if you move one thickness, you are correlated with all the frequencies. So it seems there is not a way of modifying just one frequency. Uh, and that's a problem that we will have with the guitars, as you will see in a bit. Um, secondly, and as you saw probably in the animation, that there are different shapes that are very close in the vibrational response. This is the two closest violins in terms of vibration, which it's like the way that they sound, uh, so to say, with a lot of inverted commas in between. They have a very different density, like 420 and 380. Uh, they also have a very different stiffness, but they have a similar uh, sound speed, which is the square root of the stiffness over the density. And also the shape, it's different. If you look closely, the black one is a bit thicker. Uh, the black one is the lighter, and it's also denser in the upper region. And I think the conclusions of this are like, A, you can obtain a particular sound in a violin with very different materials if your shape is different enough. Uh, and that's like kind of a good thing, like there is not just one way of making a particular violin or a particular sound of a violin. But on the other hand, um, it makes complicated to figure out the inverse problem because you have two vibrational behaviors that are very similar that in the space of geometrical and material parameters are very different. Uh, that will come later again. Checking the chat, no, okay, nothing. This plot shows the distribution of the mean frequency. I could have take also like the distribution of the first uh, or the second mode or the third mode. It's just that the, the mean of the frequency is one of the first principal values. So it's what explains most of the variance in the data set. So it's a good way of measuring things. And this it's the variation varying the outline, the arching, the thickness, or the material parameters by 10% of the distribution. Okay, so I have one density, for example, 400, and I go to 420 and 380 in that range, in a Gaussian way. And what we see is that the variation in the R thing, it's the most peaked one. It means that the variations in the R thing have the smallest influence on the frequency of all the variables. Whereas the outline, which is the most flat together with the material, are the ones that are uh, can vary the eigenfrequencies in a largest degree. And here the material changes 10%, but the outline shape only changes 5%. So in fact, the outline is the most important variable if you want to control the eigenfrequencies. Um, 
Do you want to do that? I don't know. Maybe, probably. But I think we don't know yet. Um, I talk about eigenfrequencies because um, the eigenfrequencies are ordered with the mode in, in anything that's like a violin. So whatever the shape we use, we don't find that the, the mode switch around. And as long as you fix the eigenfrequencies of two instruments, the modal shapes are also uh, similar. So except of the fifth mode, which in, in one has like a, a butterfly shape in the center, they are very, very similar. So you expect that the radiation, the acoustic radiation is going to be similar as well. Uh, OK, this is some new work that we need to submit. And I said that we have uh, the EI to predict the vibrational response. So what we do is the following. We, in the y-axis, we change some parameters in a random way. We take a random direction, and we move those parameters until we achieve a 10% variation in the eigenfrequencies. And then we try to optimize for other parameters to go back to the original um, response. OK, is that clear? Yes, I cloudy it more here. Okay, great. So if you, you are in the diagonal and if uh, you vary the outline and then optimize the outline, you go, your error is zero. Uh, there is chat. Ah, uh, it's the part. Uh, I forgot it. The probability distribution function. Thanks. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, it could be. It's the counts normalized by the the, the amount of uh, examples. In this case, it was like two thousand um, counts for each data set. Um, so, wait. I, I need to close because I don't see the mouse anymore. Back to it. Uh, so again, if you vary the outline and you optimize for the outline, our algorithm works well and, and brings it back to the original position. But if you vary the outline and you try to optimize by changing the arching, you're actually your error stays around the 10%. So if you have two different shapes, Whatever the arching you use, you're not going to get, get the same vibrational response. And by same here, uh, we mean the same uh, frequencies, so this, the same values of the frequency. The loss function is the different frequency by frequency, which may or may not be like the best way of characterizing the sound of uh, an instrument. Um, then if you optimize by the thickness, your error is lower, therefore, like plate tuning, like yes, it actually works better than arching tuning. And if you try to change the material, also your uh, error is quite high, seven percent. On the other hand, if you change any parameter, material thickness or arching, and you optimize the outline, your error is always below one percent. Uh, with the arching is not so good, and the thickness is better, like the second best way of optimizing things. Um, so, for example, like if you increase the density in a violin here in the left, you need to compensate by moving the arching in the central part, making it thinner. And if you increase the arching, on the other hand, you need to compensate by moving the outline on another direction. These are just um, examples, not the actual variation. Because uh, we do actually ensemble average. We, we do this for like 10 or 20 different random configurations. And we just look at the average error. Uh, and we're waiting for the CNC to work so we can do actually these plates with work. Um, that's, that's a part of violins. 
I mean, now comes FRF, also in violins, but if you have questions till here, and I think we need to hurry up a bit. No? Okay, no. Um, so, I'm gonna be, I, I hope I am a bit controversial with this. Um, since my formation, like, um, I came from physics, I did uh, computer simulations of grains without gravity in 2D, among other things, but like completely different area from acoustics. So I'm a like, newcomer to the field. And yeah, I, I, I've not been trained academically on this. So I'm just figuring out my way as I go. And there is something that I always found um, perplexing. It's the way in which um, people talk about the, the bridge mobility of the FRF. And for example, here, the bridge view, which I've been looking into the literature trying to find a quantitative definition of it, and I cannot find it. Um, people say, like, between 2,000 and 3,000, these lines here goes between 1,000 and 3,000. Uh, and you obtain some results, and when you plot them together, you just have a superposition of lines, which, um, yeah, for me, are absolutely impossible to understand what they mean. So, uh, and okay, that was 2005. This is a paper of last year, and, and we're still in, in the same place, like just somehow putting all the, the data there, the raw data. And so I, I don't think this is the, the way to go yet, but I think it has a, a, a way in the future, and I, I will try to make the case for that. Um, so these are like a very simple experiment that we did with Amorim, with Guy and Amorim. He, he, they work next door to us. And we have three violins where the strat model has four different configurations. So at the end, it's like seven measures. And I plot the, the FRF or the bridge admittance of, of them and, and complete, compute the variance as a function of the frequency. And one can see that there are certain regions where the variation between different violins and between one violin with different setups, it's greatest. If you compare different violins, you have um, a small peak around 500, then around 1,000. In the Bridge Hill area, it's a big one, and then something at 4,000. Um, for the strut, the variation in the low modes, in the body modes, it's way smaller. Why? Because, I mean, it's the same violin, it's just a different setup. So there is no way that you can affect those modes that much. But in the middle range, in the 2000 hertz, the variation is comparable to the, the variation between different violins. So changing the setup, we actually can make a violin sound like another one, but only in a certain region of the frequency spectrum. Uh, Sebastian, can you go back and clarify? Um, no, just, 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 yeah, this slide um, is, how many, when you say all violins, how many violins is that? And when you say strat, is that a sync? No, sing? this, this is uh, four strat models and two other violins with, in total, three configurations. Okay, this was just like a, a very uh, short experiment, one morning. So Can you repeat again? Three, How many violins? It's three violins with a total of five configurations. Uh, so the Strat has four configurations and the Warnieri model has two configurations. And okay. is this, this is measured I, I or...? Yes, it's measured. We measure the, the bridge admittance of all the, the instruments with the different setup, changing the bridge and 
changing the tapis, and that what we obtained. But I, mean, I know it, it, it was too little, so I say like maybe it's, it's a thing of numbers. Uh, and this is for 25 violins, uh, which is a mix of contemporary violins that we measure last year from Mondo Musica, the winners of the Triennale that we have upstairs, plus two struts, or three, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think it's three. And the, the, the results are show the same structure, like a variation. Here, actually, the, the high peak in the frequency is a bit shifted to 2,500, but you have that the low modes vary a lot, and, and then in the bridge hill, there is the, the most variation in the signal. So, okay. And by, excuse me, by variation in the signal, do you mean in the frequency of the peak or its relative amplitude? Uh, for each frequency, I take the standard deviation of the signal. Uh, like, for example, here I divide by frequency and measure what's the spread of the signal. Okay. So for each, each frequency band in the FRF, you mean? Yes. Okay. So it's a change in frequency then? It's a variation mm -hmm. in frequency? It's a variation yes. in power? It's a variation in power as yeah, a function of the frequency. Instruments. So yeah, let's, uh, let's make sure everybody understands that previous graph. Um, yeah, okay, that one. Or, or go to the next one. Um, yeah, so what you're saying is that in this um, group of instruments that you've measured, that the instruments are much more different from each other, for example, in the two to three kilohertz band, and more yes. similar to each other in some of the other bands. Is that, yes. am I interpreting correctly? Okay. Yes, Thank you. exactly. A different in terms of power. Different in terms of power, yes. So the amplitude Which, of the bridge admittance. So the, what you call power is the amplitude of the bridge admittance. Yes, the amplitude of the bridge admittance. Um, okay, so like looking forward to this region where they vary a lot. Um, I'm just getting hot. Um, zooming in the bridge admittance for this one violin, four different setups. So Stradivarius is the original, the one in red, and the ones in dark red and Dutch lines are the variations for the same setup. And this is what the Luthier found, like the, the red one, it's the best configuration, the, the optimal sound of this, just like four simple cases. Um, and one thing you, you can see immediately, it's, it's not the amplitude in this like, um, bridge hill that makes the, the best. Uh, maybe it is the degree of variation. The, the red one, it's, it's a bit more constant, but um, there is no clear way of distinguishing what makes it better. Uh, in the low frequency range, you see that the peaks are all in the same position. Okay, maybe the fourth one is a bit moved, but this needs to be compensated by the experimental error. Um, and, you know, we, we see that the red, for example, the first peak, it's, it's the highest amplitude. But um, in general, they are very consistent and the frequencies are at the same location. Uh, what's the point of this? That I think one, we just cannot look at the FRF by itself. We need to define uh, quantitative uh, observables of the data. And we have tried to do that in this paper with Rafael. But in that case, we look only at the low frequency range and the first peaks, which um, according to this, like probably, our observables need to also consider the higher frequency bands in some way. Um, okay, so in general, like these are the, the three different uh, models of the, the violins we measure with Amorim. 
uh, Cerruti happens to be the, the, the one that was the, the best sound of the three. But I mean, there is no like single peak where the Bridge Hill supposedly is. Uh, Stradivarius has, and I made a mistake here, this is not the same line as before in red. I'm sorry for that. Um, but I think this is a case of, of trying to find, um, I mean, there is a paper that says that a good violin has a bridge hill around 2,000, 3,000 um, hertz. And I think we cannot make those kind of conclusions because the variation is just too big. So what I think could be the answer? Uh, and I think we maybe don't need an answer. Uh, this is an example of an artificial intelligence looking for cancer. And the good thing of this is that for cancer, sadly, you have much more data than for violins. And you know how one thing looks. I mean, you can do the exam, see if there is cancer, you keep the data, and you train artificial intelligence, and you let the computer to figure out what are the actual correlations that explain what makes a positive or a good violin and a bad violin. But for that, actually, we need the data. And probably what we need would be like a standard procedure to take it, um, some kind of common repository so we can study it. And I think even subjective valuations, if you average enough people, that could give us an answer. And so my point would be, I think there is not an answer in the FRF yet, but we could figure out the correlations if we put together enough data. And I think, Rob, yeah. Okay, more questions here? No? I have a question. When you when yeah. you say enough data, do you mean dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions? What kind of scale are we talking? For the cancer paper, the, there is one in the I think two years ago that was amazingly little data, and they use a thousand uh, pictures mm. to train the neural network. So I mean, we have twenty five uh, violins. So between a few Look here, I think we could do go into the thousands easily. Uh, yeah, but it, it, it will depend on you. I mean, you don't know it till you try it. And if you try it and it doesn't work, uh, maybe your architecture is wrong. So you need to fix it. It's a, it's a tricky question. Yeah. I, mean, I hope it's 25, so we could have the answer. Uh, okay, and now metamaterials and guitars, and I will like split it in between a bit too, going back to the material aspects of the instrument. A metamaterial is uh, a material in which the properties, its properties are dependent on the geometry of a certain pattern that you have on it, rather than in the bulk material itself. So you can have like ele electric metamaterials, acoustic metamaterials, optical metamaterials that behave in a weird way. And we wanted to do the acoustic or mechanical metamaterials with the guitars because it's, um, luthiers have been doing it with Nomex. I will show a picture later. But so the idea is to make little holes in the inside of the guitar and see what happens. Um, but before that, like this is a work we're doing with Alex Brachler in Germany, and it's uh, classical guitar optimization. We have, um, he has actually, an amazing uh, laser vibrometer setup, and hits it with a hammer, and with some mathematical magic, can do the experimental visualization of the eigen modes of this uh, guitar plate that I built. Uh, and I built them in such a way that they were, they have the same geometry, they have the same mass distribution more or less in the bracing, 
and they have the same thickness and weight. But the density and the stiffness of the top plates changes. And the idea is that can we optimize the bracing or like the geometry in general such that we can copy the vibrational response of a target plate. So we have two plates with uh, different materials. How do I change the geometry so they are equivalent? Uh, and this is what we did. We started with a very thick bracelet, 30 millimeters, just because we want to have extra material to do more experiments. In a guitar, they, they should be three, but it's just a proof of concept. And we have top one, which is the, the line at one, which have, we have top two, which is the, the one in the left with all the braces at the same height. Uh, and that gives us the blue curve. So the first mode, it's almost a 10% different. This in, at that range, it was like one pound no, one semitone of difference. So between top one was G and top two was G sharp, the first mode. And we have an optimization process that, okay, not very surprisingly, told us that if we want to lower the eigenfrequencies of the plate, we need to take thickness out of the braces. And we took the thickness out and we actually could reduce the error from the first four in a very nice way, but the fifth mode went down like crazy. Um, and this, if you remember, it's the same problem as here. When you move something in one part, you don't affect just one mode, you affect all of them. Um, yeah, but the, the nice thing is that we can do this in the computer and we actually do experiment by hand and it, it works. I mean, the computer tells us how to optimize the thing. Um, okay, can I move this? Um, but the problem is that in our case, like we have seven different braces with seven different material parameters, I mean, actually, seven times nine material parameters. So, if you try to make an optimization, like, you have many possible combinations of material parameters that give you the same vibrational answer. Just like in the case of the violin, um, they can be very different, but they will vibrate the same way. And if you, like you try to optimize something, in this case, like the final vibrational response, it will depend where you start in this weird landscape of parameters where you're going to end up. So our optimization is dependent on how well we can identify material parameters in the system. Um, okay, here it's again. Uh, so the, the problem we have here is that the vibration, what I call F of the violin with X, Y1, Y1, C1. It's very similar to F of another different violin with another parameters. And when you go from like X, the material domain, into the acoustic domain, you have one function, F. But when you go back, you have F minus one that takes you back. And in the case of material parameters, what you have is that you have one, I mean, if you have a small error in the identification of the material parameters, you end up in two very different places in the material space. So even if we had a good way of characterizing the material, that doesn't ensure us that we can actually find the minimum because we have no idea where we are. There, there is pretty much no way if you don't know each 
piece uh, of the guitar or what it's your oh I got lost there um, If you don't know all the material parameters, like with absolute certainty, like you don't know where you are in the landscape of optimization to start. So you may find a minimum that's actually not a minimum. Uh, okay, and now I'll go to the metamaterials and I'll go try to hurry up. Uh, this is what I, I told you at the beginning that metamaterials are already used in guitar making. And people have tried to like lower the weight of the guitar and keep the stiffness constant. So the guitar vibrates more and produces more sound. Uh, and they do that by using Nomex in the left, which is a polymer with honeycomb structure, or simply by routing channels or holes or patterns into a top plate. Uh, and yes, I, I imagine this being done in violence too. I mean, why not? Uh, and this is another little video. Sorry, fast music, forgot about that. Uh, I take a plate of, a, a guitar plate, a guitar size plate, and make holes in it. And uh, as I rotate the holes, the modal shapes change, and as well as the frequencies. And depending on the way in which you change the parameter, the, the geometry of the holes, it, the change in the mode frequencies varies also. And you have this weird mode switching, like uh, what was the, the, the fundamental mode, it's different. You can have also Poisson plates uh, and weird things. And from um, Woodhouse and Calder's new formulas, we know that the stiffness of a plate this is that like guitar plate, three millimeters by 50 by 20. Uh, the stiffness depends on these modes, on the fundamental longitudinal and the fundamental radial. So if we vary the modes, it means that we are actually varying the stiffness of the plate, which um, in principle, it would be great because we know that wood is a natural material with a very variable range of material parameters. But if we have a way to figure out how to make the material that we actually want, we take one variable out of the equation. So, and these are like uh, just a few plots showing the effect of the aspect ratio, so how elongated the ellipse is either in the longitudinal direction or in the radial direction. And you can see that um, if you see closely in the plot A, the color of the arrow changes between the longitudinal stiffness, which is the upper line. And I'm sorry, I don't have the cursor. No. And the lower line is the radial stiffness. So when you put holes in one direction, you affect one stiffness way more than the other. And that implies that you also can change the anisotropy ratio and the acoustic radiation index, which is a, a function of the stiffness and the density. Uh, if you vary the angle for different densities, you have the same, like changing the angle will change the longitudinal stiffness. And the radial is the same, but rotated 45, 90 degrees because of symmetry. It, uh, you expect it to be a standard solder function. Those little jumps that you see in the highest density are because there is mode switching, so we don't know really where is the fundamental mode. Uh, we did experimental validation of this. You can see the contour of the guitar plate. And as expected, actually this, this was like, we really felt like Einstein predicting the shifting of the light in the eclipse. It's the first time I do experiments. Uh, and they behave as the simulation. So the vertical eclipse, ellipse in the radial elasticity is in one place, it's up, 
whereas for the longitudinal elasticity, it's the other way around. So you actually can control the stiffness of the plate by making little holes. Uh, and yeah, I think five minutes I run. So uh, this is a previous work from Maria, a student here in Polimi. The previous was done with Chile. I, at the end, I will acknowledge everybody. And we wanted to try it in a guitar. So we put these holes in the soundboard of a guitar. And what happens when you have the solid top, you have one vibrational response, the, the yellow curve here. And if you put the ellipses longitudinally, they lower a bit the, the stiffness. Consequently, the vibrations and the eigenfrequencies go down, but it's less than in the case of the radial one. However, this is for the free top plate. When you go into the complete body, the variation is way smaller. So the, the boundary conditions are important here. Um, but we didn't look just at the vibrational behavior. Also, we don't want to um, soften the material too much that the guitar will break. So we look at increasing the hole size to the red, you know, root mean square displacement of the field that you can see in the right when you put a force in the bridge simulating the strings. And here, just like we predicted in the theory and the experiments for the plate show, longitudinal holes and radial holes have a different behavior. The longitudinal holes are more stiff actually, and they follow a continuous line. And these dashed lines are lines of increasing sound speed. So you actually can go to higher uh, sound speed by making holes in the material. Because you lower the density, you lower the stiffness, but not as much. So the ratio actually becomes higher. And I think that's something that instrument makers want in general. Um, finally, the last one is that when we do the FRF uh, for these three different tops, we find that the one with the longitudinal hole actually also vibrates more, so it has more sound to it more than the, the solid top and more than the radial. And that's it, yeah. So thanks a lot and thanks to the team, like here in the Metamaterials in Chile, it's Carolina Espinosa, my colleague, Emil Traga, master student, Matia from Polini, uh, also master student, David Salvi, who's now a PhD student here, Daniel Baeza, again in Chile, Alex Brauchler in Germany, yes, that direction, um, and Gaia Namurin and Rafael Malverdi from here for the FRF. And thanks all of you for your attention. And if you have questions, please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Wow, you covered a lot of different uh, materials here. So <laughs> thank you so much. So um, if you have questions, uh, please, uh, use the uh, raise hands function. So um, questions? Oh, we have a lot of clapping. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, but are, are there, let's see, Evan. So, oh, Evan. Yeah, um, when you did your uh, metamaterials, did you measure damping in the plates? No, but we can. We actually, that's a great question. I'm going to put it directly in the to-do list of the, uh, but we did measure the damping here. And it's not as clear that one one pattern has like the, the lowest damping always. It depends on the mode. So, yeah.
Any other questions, Evan? No, that's well, one uh, struck me because we used to drill holes in plates to add uh, flow damping to have a cheap damping mechanism. Just wondered it wondered if it showed up in this data set. All right. Um, Robert. Hi, Fan hi Fantao. Hi, Joseph. How e hi, everybody. Yeah, great to see you. Great to see you. Uh, thanks, Sebastian, for this great talk. Um, there are two things that might be interesting for you. One is we just do this month a publication on, in JASA uh, on the angle dependency of carbon in plates and how the modes would go there. So may, maybe you want to have a look at it and, and check cross-check things. Okay. This is the one thing that's, uh, that might be interesting for you, but you have shown similar things. So we, it, it looks quite similar what you did. And the other thing is um, that would be really fun to work together with you. Uh, last year I did a publication on a Faustino Conde guitar, uh, which revealed four resonances where all other res four resonances in a range where all other guitars have only one or two resonances. And it, I was wondering how it comes, and I, I learned that this comes from uh, specific asymmetry in the guitar, in the bracing. Okay. And bridge overhang, which I call overhang over the, those braces, and the coupling between top and back plate. And this is a very sensitive uh, tuning. So that would be very, very interesting if, if I want to redo this guitar, I want to build it actually in, in the next life probably, but that would be great to combine it with your findings. I think that would be really fun. So then yeah. the other talk, uh, publication I'm talking about is um, in the title, it's asymmetrically braced guitars. And you find it, I think, in February last year in, in Jaza. And the, the other thing on carbon plates is in, in this month. It's online already, but it will come in March, uh, in, in, in April or in April or uh, some, it's due now. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Just um, send me a mail. I'm going to just um, leave my mail there. Yeah, great. So I, I, I love to build guitars. Actually, I find it nicer than violins. Violins are too small for my stupid hands. Great, thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you, Robert. Um, Joseph? Um, yes, where does the term metamaterials come from? I, I don't know that particular term. Well, I have no idea. I just know they are called like that. I mean. Probably because they are a bit beyond the material that you started with, but I... so is that, uh, Joseph, I could I could add a comment there if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so you can I think I think uh, the the it was it was described well in the talk you know in saying that you construct uh, geometric features that result in some kind of different material behavior, but so you can actually. Um, make these geometric features at a small scale and then sort of homogenize the equations to say what kind of um, bulk properties would a material have to have to perform as does this material with these small features. And so you and, and so when you do that, you can end up with weird things that aren't physically possible. If you view it as just the material moduli having these properties. Um, okay. okay, so it's usually used as a, um, it's a class of materials where you have um, small modifications at a small scale to affect the, the overall properties, something like that. Yeah, yeah. and, and you, um, when, when, when you do that, you can, you can create things that from a, a bird's eye view look like a material that couldn't exist in nature if it were just a solid homogeneous piece of material. So I think that's the motivation for calling it meta, you know, beyond uh, just materials. You can have, Thank you. Uh, you know, negative moduli or things like that if you put little structures that make, so you pull one way and something goes the other way. Um. All right. Um, it's a huge field of research in acoustics. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Most of the interest, like um, uh, Sean says, is is um, in materials that you can't really get in nature. Um, you know, 
So, um, all right, um, Mark. Hi, Sebastian. Thanks for the talk. You mentioned um, with the kind of changing, like cutting circles into the material, changing the speed of sound. Is it really? I'm wondering if it's really changing the speed of sound. Um, because like the, the stiffness density relationship is an approximation, right? Um, like I think that that holds when the Poisson ratio goes to zero, um, but it's it's actually dependent on the Poisson ratio at higher values. So I wonder if that's changing and that's what's accounting for the difference, or can we look I mean, into that for, anymore? For the okay, I mean, yes, you're you're right. It depends on the Poisson ratio, but. Um, I mean, we haven't done simulations to measure directly the, okay, yeah. the, the speed. So we could do it with experiments and, and a glucometer, but we don't have one in Chile. And that, that's, that's a good one. I, I think yeah. I will do it. I mean, we assume that the approximation holds. And yeah. It, yeah, but I don't but, know. I mean, yeah, I don't know how well it... I mean, holds in general, even with the looking meter, like, because there's some variation in the speed of sound measurement. And, like, with woods, it's usually, like, it should be, you know, I think it holds up to maybe reasonably well, up to like 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 um, Poisson ratio. I, I, I mean, okay, despite that, like, I'm happy with having a higher mobility. That's like, for me, it's more sound than yeah, sure. the same as. Yes. You don't change much the the location of the eigen mode, so it's like yeah, it's yeah. Cool. If I can make an instrument lighter and just as stiff, I'm happy with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's cool. I was just wondering about yeah, the speed of sound. Yeah, but yeah. Well, well, just to comment on this, if you allow, yeah, go ahead, Robert. But uh, I think the speed of sound in the material there shouldn't be much difference. But what what about the critical frequency? So the frequency at which a radiation becomes efficient. And this critical frequency um, goes down, and that's what you want. You want to that the low frequencies radiate as well in instruments. And the critical frequency goes down with, with thickness of a plate. So with one and the same material, whether metamaterial or not, the thicker the plate, the lower the critical frequency. And that may be the, an effect that you have in mind. I, I will look into it. We haven't. Yeah, you, you, you may look up uh, the publications of George Bissinger for that. I'm writing it down. Uh, Be, because you can, you can scale down a lot of the frequencies. Uh, that's a good piece of work of George Bissinger. You can scale down a lot of the plate modes and the body modes. Mm -hmm. If you look at the high value Italian masterpieces, and they scale down to two frequencies. One is the cri critical frequency, which has much to do with the thickness. And the other thing is the, is in the statistical region is the uh, frequency of the, of the bridge, the rocking frequency. All right. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Colin, you're next. Yeah. Yeah, just just a clarification. Um, uh, when you put holes in things, it doesn't really change the properties of, of the material on a very large scale. And the important thing is that the holes you're making is, are very much short and smaller than the acoustic wavelengths of the vibrational modes. And therefore, for example, if you take weight out, if you take weight out of it, you're changing the density. But of course, um, you can also check, uh, as you quite rightly explained you can also change the elastic properties if you put slits in that are very small that are going along the direction that you want things to bend easily around those slits um, that would change the bending stiffness around there so the shape that's where the shape of the hose comes in and why for example when you had your things and you change them round um, in different directions you can change the the the, the elastic properties of the wood but um, the actual wood itself, um, that the materials that you're making it from, as quite people say, is basically 
unchanged. But but it's a meta material because you've made it into a material that's got holes in it. But we've got lots of examples of materials that've got holes in it, um, it that we use all around us. And when you take the water out of something, you're le leaving water. You're leaving holes behind, um, and that's a meta material in a certain sense. So I think, I think wood. It's it's a meta material. It's made of like fibers, dense and not so dense, and arranged like that. And that's why when I put the holes along the fibers, it's I don't affect much, whereas if I cut the fibers, I do change the, the material. And um, yeah, I, I know the, the wood is not changing, but the way the plate behaves, it's, it behaves as if it's made of another material. And the, the nice things of that is that I can control my density and my stiffness, so I can figure out what material I want. And with global warming and like running out of wood because the heat is eating the, the space for them to live, we are not going to have nice spruce in the future. So I think this is maybe a way of fixing that. All right, um, Claudia. Yeah, thanks for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, my question was about like more, uh, you talk about the vibration of the plates just by the eigenfrequencies. And, and so that's not just, uh, I mean, you cannot reduce the dynamic behavior just in terms of eigenfrequencies. So have you considered other parameters or, or why did you choose the eigenfrequencies in the first place? Or, you know, why do you only consider this for now? Okay, the, we selected the, um, let, me, let me go to the slide that shows it. Okay, the easiest way for us, like, I mean, we didn't know it was going to work and we wanted to, to try it. It's like, pretend, uh, look for numbers. Numbers are easier to simulate than uh, fields, which is like the model shape. And that's why we went for just like the frequencies and we stop at, I think, frequency five or 10. That, that's what we, we do. Um, but after like our experiment, where is that one? Here. Um, for the case of violin shape objects, the model shape, it's not varying that much. So that says that, okay, like if you know the frequency, that's a good approximation, first order. Eventually, I mean, and something we've been doing, uh, it's we want to reproduce the frequency response function. So you start with um, a set of parameters and, and you reproduce this curve. And this curve can be seen as a like superposition of exponential or like Lorentz functions, uh, and you can fit the parameters of those. So the neural network, what's going to learn, it's like a bit more complex representations of numbers to other numbers that represent the thing. And if, if, if you want to predict something else, I mean, we can try it. Uh, but, but, I mean, I if you want to predict this curve, you need the amplitude, for example. Yes, and that's a number. That's a number. And the, if you have a, let's say a Gaussian fit to it, uh, you fit that with three numbers or so. Yeah. And it, in this case, the, the neural network, instead of learning just the frequency, which is where is located this peak, it also learns the amplitude and the width. And actually, um, we have a master's student, he just finished looking for a PhD also. Uh, and we showed that the neural network, uh, a bit more complicated neural network, can predict both the frequency and the amplitude in this case. Uh, but it's more complicated. So like the first step was just the frequency. Yes, very nice. Thanks. All right, thank you, Claudia. Uh, Evan, back to Evan. It helps if I unmute myself. Um, Metamaterial engineering um, honeycomb panels are probably one of your easiest 
metamaterials to play with, especially in the flat plate situation. Um, the name metamaterial, as Sean said, was kind of changing configurations, but simple brace plates or honeycomb panels or composite layups all have you know, a lot of material behind them on calculating things like your critical frequencies and your stiffnesses and such, and can be generalized with only a few parameters. So I would suggest diving into that literature a little bit for the metamaterials. I like the hole cutting type thing, um, and uh, I've played with different things to try and keep things from vibrating and radiating. And Colin kind of alluded to this, if you do very, very small holes, the air won't squeak through. If you have a bigger hole, you'll have a, a bigger damping effect. So hmm. very interesting work. You have a lot of fun. Uh, Metamaterials was a new name to an old technology for a lot of us guys who are retired. <laughs> uh, okay, so a few comments on that. Uh, actually, the, the guitar makers, they cover the holes with a veneer. Yeah. So they have 0 0.5 a spruce top. Uh, a core and then 0 0.5 millimeters on the other side. We didn't want to go there because of the glue. We don't know how the glue behaves. So it's, and, and it makes it more stiff. So we say, okay, simpler, let's make the, the holes. And that's also easier to produce with the CNC, which is the question to Roberto Regatti. So, so um, on, on the um, guitar tops, because I've done work on, um, similar designs for, for guitar makers in years past. Um, you really need to account for your glue because glues tend to be very dense materials. Yes. And so if you just take the simple case of take the spruce, cut it in two and glue it back, you know, you, you've regained all your stiffness, but you've added mass, so you lose. And um, the, the engineering of glue in lightweight composite materials becomes one of the arts of the trade. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that we have a like CT scan, like uh, 3D tomography, like macro tomography. So we want to see the the glue in the in the wood, but actually the the resolution was not good enough to to capture how you have the glue. It's it's one of the things, and maybe next year we have time to do it. But I think first we're gonna do a guitar just with the holes from one side. That's the that's objective. I'll, I'll send you an email in confidence on some of the projects I was involved in. Sorry, come again. I I will send you an email at, where I can discuss some of the things I can't discuss publicly. Okay, thanks. All right. Thank you, Evan. Um, Joseph. Um. Yes, uh, well, thank, you, thank you for this uh, fascinating uh, look at things, Sebastian. Uh, a number of questions um, c come to my mind. Um, I, w I was struck by the notion that changing the arching was less important than changing the thickness for affecting mode frequencies. I seem to remember from Cullen's FEA work, it was the opposite. Cullen, could you just throw in? Uh, um, um, that, that, that was certainly um, an outcome of my FEA work, and I mean, and it's obvious, in fact, that arching is incredibly important. Um, uh, as soon as you put particularly particular um, ribs around the outside, and you're changing the mode shapes, um, and um, certainly the FEA measurements which agreed very well with the experimental um, results um, in, in terms of predicting frequencies showed that the, um, uh, the, mo the, the low frequency modes, we're only talking about low frequency modes and we're talking, particularly talking about the signature modes, um, they, they're, they're particularly strongly affected by the arching. Whereas the higher frequency modes, when, when the arching the, the wavelength of the plate modes gets shorter, they don't see so much arching. It seems flatter to them. So the arching becomes less important, but nevertheless, it still remains important right up to the, the higher frequencies that you know, we're involved in. I mean, certainly the kilohertz range. But certainly for the, the important um, B1 minus B1 plus modes, 
are very strongly affected by the arching. But that specific modes, and if we're talking about statistical sort of um, distribution of modes, of course, it becomes perhaps less important um, because you're averaging things out. And of course, the arching depends on, on the particular types of modes and all modes are different from each other and depends on mode shape. And, and Jim has had a lot of experience of, of you know, the mode shape dependence of things. But one of the things about the modes on a violin, it's essentially a shell structure, and the modes are two-dimensional. So that you know, they're varying in two, two directions at the same time. So it's not surprising that things like an isotropy, for example, isn't quite as important necessarily as you might expect. And um, um, these things presumably come out of the um, work, Sebastian, that you've been doing. I mean, I, I missed, I'm very sorry, the very beginning of your talk, so I wasn't quite sure what, what the, 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 the model set up was, but were you dealing with... Yes. with yeah. um, perhaps, perhaps you could comment. Yeah, I, I, I think there, there is um, one thing. I mean, uh, we can probably we're going to publish the, all the data when we publish the paper, and, but I'm thinking that the variation of the arching, the, the way I parameterize it, it's with, uh, I do a exponential change of coordinates between like the arching coordinate and the X coordinate. So 10% there, it's a bit weird. I, I don't know if it's actually 10%. And probably we should have a historical example. I mean, this is actual data of the arching variation of five violins I have. And, and this is like how they look. Maybe that's too little or um, not enough to see this variation. It, it may be, but... Okay. The other thing is that this is free plates. Uh, and we know that when we change the boundary conditions, the importance of the things that, the importance of the variations, the parameters are probably going to change because you have like different modes. So those are two things we need to see. Actually, I wanted to have the results for clamp boundary conditions for this talk, but we didn't have time. I don't know if that answered your question, but I mean, when the paper comes on, you can look at the data yourself. Can I, can I just add a comment? You, you, you've said the main thing I was going to say, but absolutely, your violin results were all for free plates. Four of the first five modes of a free plate are essentially in extensional modes, uh, as Jan Paul Beldia first pointed that out. Um, there are no inextensional modes in the complete body. Um, so Colin's work is all was talking about um, <clears throat> complete corpus, and there the arching turns out to be very sensitive. Um, there's a simple reason it's in, Lord Rayleigh knew it, uh, why inextensional modes are not sensitive to the arching shape. So free plates are really quite different from assembled bodies in a, in a shell structure like the violin. So, which of the, which of the first five modes, Jim, isn't extensional? Is Number it mode five. Two? That's what, the only reason the ring mode is interesting is that it's it, it involves significant stretching. Uh, that's why it's the one you can hear in your fingers because you don't damp it out so much. All the others are moving around the edge. It's the one that's moving around a little at the edge. Oh, I see. I misheard you. You were saying inextensional. I thought you were saying they're all extensional. So only mode no, no, five it, is extensional. That, that, they're all inextensional except uh, uh, with the maximum amplitude around the edges. Um, but, yeah. Okay. But Jim, when 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 you've got an arch plate, um, and you vibrate that in in the perpendicular direction, it is it becomes extensional it mixes in in fact not the, necessarily uh, not necessarily that's what Rayleigh did if the geometry allows in extensional deformation that always gives you the low modes 1877 <laughs> church but, 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 bells but, but, wine glasses 
<laughs> I think, Jim, that, that, that's true for a bean, but it's not true for a plate. No, no, it's true for a shell. Cons consider this shell structure that I'm holding in my hand. You see this? Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I can't see it. <laughs> the, it's a wine glass. All right. The yes, reason okay. you can hear yeah. a rather low frequency when you ping it is because that N equals 2 mode is inextensional. Okay. Um, and that, that's the, the, the free violin plate is doing the same thing for those first four modes. So, sorry, sorry I, 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 agree, I agree about that, but, but uh, that doesn't mean to say that the edges don't move. You're, you, I mean, it, it, uh, and, and, and the, the energy involved in that motion is involved in, in, in the sound that you actually hear. You, you're, uh, everyone's gone very quiet. I would suggest oh. we would move on to another we, subject. We, Jim, okay. and I could, Jim and I can, can sort this out ourselves. All right. Mm. Uh, Joseph, did you want to continue? Yeah, I had a, a, a sort of second half was, it's more philosophical. It, it seems to me the thrust of this is to say that you can imitate this material by changing shape or something or, or vice versa. But it seems to me that, I mean, my intuition is that could only be true for some limited set of parameters. It seems like if you have objects of different shapes, they're gonna be different in some way in the way they vibrate. There may be some way of lining up some set of parameters, but isn't it in principle impossible to get two different objects to do the same thing? I, that's a, a general, question and it's sort of philosophical but uh i actually i, I try to because i have that same like thinking in my mind and it's like depends what you want to accomplish if you have for example say a bridge around two points and you want to to hold a certain amount of weight like that's your your function that you want to maximize you can obtain that with several configurations of like width and stiffness and density and it, it always depends what you want to do with it so there is no one solution for like structural vibrational problems i think it's a bit you have too many degrees of freedom so you always can choose uh, lighter wood and less stiff but bigger you know it, it's it, hmm. if you want to make i mean you want to make a chair out of a spruce, it probably needs to be thicker than a seat made out of beach, just like. Yeah, so it isn't one aspect. So um, this is um, in terms of ma matching mode frequencies, but, but you can have very different uh, mechanical impedances. So depending on how that structure is being used, I mean, um, I think Sebastian gives one specific example where you know has to hold a certain um, load or something like that but i think if you're putting a plate into a more complex structure of a uh, a violin then even if they're matched in mode frequencies they may behave very differently in the more complex structure yes I mean, that, that that's what we want to actually that's why we have submitted the paper with david, david because we want to make the plates out of real wood and see if they actually behave in a similar way. So probably in six months, we will have the answer. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? OK, then um, I, I have a, cu a couple of questions. Uh, first, a, cu a comment, Sebastian, because I, um, we do know that there have been some violin makers that have experimented with you know, like cutting grooves in, in the plates. So. Um, um, some makers have experimented with that. Um, my, my question has to do with your um, um, neural nets. You know, right now you're, you're using it to um, um, tell you something about um, you know, a relatively simple parameter of the, of the, of the free plates. Um, do you think it, um, but, but we know that um, in, in real violins, um, it's not just the, the lower frequency signature modes that are important, but as you pointed out in your um, you know, bridge admittance, the, the higher frequencies mm -hmm. are also important. Um, 
Do you envision okay. possibilities for using neural nets to investigate other frequency regions and more complex, you know, yes. parameters? <laughs> yes. There, there is a, what we have done also with Raffaele, and that like there was so much data that we got a bit overwhelmed, is we simulate uh, thousands of FRF, okay, maybe 500, uh, and we try to compute the principal value of the composition, so to see how they are changing in average. And, and in that way, you can kind of reduce the complexity of this like almost infinite dimensional data, like 4,000 points, into some more manageable like vectors. Um, we still don't have results there because it's too much data, but I think it can be done. It's just um, a question of getting enough data and trying to let, let the machine simplify it. Because, I mean, if, if you think of it, the FRF, which is this like multi, for like 4,000 dimensional vector, it's actually determined by just nine material parameters, the geometry, and the boundary conditions. That, that's it. And the location where you're measuring also. Uh, so it cannot, it cannot be too complicated. It's not, there is a lot of autocorrelation in the signal. So you can figure a, a proper representation of it. And, and, and we love to do that. I mean, All right. I think we need a few master and PhD students for that though. But you think it's possible? <laughs> yes, I think it's possible. Okay. Uh, Joseph? Uh, yes, I wanted to second your frustration at not being able to find a good definition of the bridge hill, because I think that the field isn't in an unsatisfactory state. It's something I've, I've um, worried uh, Jim about from time to time, and he has a definition, um, which I understand, but it's, I think, far removed from what um, most of us would come up with. Um, there's definitions from admittance. You could look at it from radiation. Um, and I, I think it is something we need we need to get back to. I, I would certainly like to do more experimental work with it. And we, we come across this with bridge tuning experiments. But um, I'd say you're not missing something in, in, in the inability to find a clear definition there. And it's something I think we need to address more. Jim. Just to follow up on that one, I mean, Eric Janssen started the hair running on the Bridge Hill, and there's nothing wrong with his definition. The, the, the best definition of it is not to look at the amplitude plot, but the phase plot. You want the smooth trend through the phase plot, and you want the place where the phase has got halfway down to minus 90 degrees. That's the, um, so the, that's, that's the, the classic definition. But one won't find that in any accessible materials stated clearly. So I think you're. I think that's a great thing to um, um, have more um, clearly presented in, in an easily accessible form. Yeah. The, 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 pro the problem is surely that in many, many measurements, certainly in radiation, the phase is changing all the time by huge amounts. Uh, you can't do it from radiation measurements. You've got to do a structural measurement. You can only define the bridge hill properly from, from a bridge admittance, not from a microphone measurement, for sure. <laughs> you can use a mi microphone inside, inside the cavity. Still won't. Doesn't have the, doesn't have that, the formula. That's part, that, that's, part, that's, part, that's part of the, the, um, the whole system. And uh, you, you're looking at the eigen modes of the system. So... I, I do think it actually follows that you might be able to follow it, but I'm in, uh, in, in that way. Um, There's a difference between interior and the radiation fields. The, the interior field is part of the structure. So if we, um, if we accept, Jim's, that the only way to find it is by looking at the phase of a structural measurement, um, that's that's excellent to know. At the same time, there's been papers upon papers and comments about 
the bridge hill affecting the quality of the instrument. And the quality of this but surely has nothing to do with the point on the, 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 the phase slope. So I think we need to get at a better description of it and, and put it in one place. Sure, sure, surely it's just a phenomenological effect that, 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 that somewhere or other there's going to be a maximum in, in the <clears throat> output of the violin as a function of frequency. We all know it goes off eventually at high frequencies and very low, very low frequencies. And there happens to be a peak around where um, that we, we call the Bridge Hill. Now, um, that was identified to start with, um, very much certainly with the actual bridge, the bridge and the, and the top of the bridge um, rocking backwards and forwards. But as soon as you put that into the system, of course, it, that, 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 that vibration, now it interacts with all the other vibrations all around with it. And so you no longer see that, that bridge rocking frequency because it's spread out amongst all the other modes all around it. And, um, but it almost certainly does lead to a, a, a slight amplification or an amplification of modes in its region because it's, it's, it's the, the bridge is the most important part of the filter because it's where, where, where the energy goes in from the strings into the body of the instrument. So that top of the bridge is important. As you know, um, uh, uh, and, and Jim, Jim's done some lovely um, demonstrations with different, very different um, bridge hills and thicknesses of things. And you could ensure here the difference in the sound. But, and, and you can measure it in the radiation. And you can measure it in all sorts of other properties as well. But often, often it's not, it, I mean, it, there isn't in many, many measurements a very pronounced hill. It's just a rather broad ma um, maximum. I, mean, I think if you look um, in the radiation spectrum, you'll, you'll never find a pronounced hill where the admittance maximum is, you'll find it uh, around two kilohertz or below. Um, yeah. So, so uh, and that's what we hear. Anyway, we don't need to define it now, but I, I, I do think the subject remains interesting and, and could use some, some clarification for the, for the, you know, for the, the group at large. Thanks. All right. Um do we have any other questions? Okay, um, let, let's, um, this will end the formal part of the presentation and uh, let's give a great round of applause to Sebastian.